We're going to read Matthew 8, 1 to 3. When he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Thank you, Lord, for your word. We pray, Holy Spirit, you touch us and impact us, change our way of living and thinking to be in alignment with your will. In, your, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jennifer. Yes, sir. All right. Jesus had just given the Sermon on the Mount to a crowd of people, and he came down from the mountain. He came down from the exalted place. He came down from the crowds uh, that he was speaking to. And he sees one man that all of uh, the society, the community, would avoid. The leper, the one who has rotting flesh. And is supposed to be an outcast from the rest of society. A person that no one would touch. And the first man and the only man that Jesus comes to is the leper that falls on his knees before him and said, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Before this, in, in, if we read in Matthew chapters 5, 5 to 7, it is Jesus speaking the Beatitudes. He's speaking how a Christian should live and the principles of our faith, how we should act. He talks about how to be blessed in our actions. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you. And then he goes on to talk about being salt and light, that we have to bring the glory of God into our communities, into the people's lives around us, the light of the word and the gospel. And he also says Christ came to fulfill the law, all those Ten Commandments and beyond that. And he says Jesus came as the sacrifice and the blood covers you in all your sins. He talks about not being angry, and not to judge one another. He talks about lust and that we should pluck out our right eye if it causes us to sin or cut off our hand if it cuts, causes us to sin. He talks about divorce and that we should not divorce. He talks about not taking oaths. He talks about not retaliating when someone harms you by saying, turn the other cheek. And he tells us to love our enemies. He tells us not to practice righteousness to be seen by others, but to do it privately and let God reward us for it. And he tells us the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven. He tells us that we should fast and that we shouldn't lay up treasures in, on earth, but lay up treasures in heaven. Do not be anxious. And he tells us not to throw our pearls before the pigs and the golden rule, which is to love others as you would have them treat you, treat others the way you would have them treat you. And he also warns us to enter by the narrow gate, for broad is the way that leads to destruction, but narrow is the gate that leads to eternal life. And how to judge a tree by its fruit, that what comes out of us indicates whether we are a good or bad tree. And he also says not to go and to remember that if we are workers of lawlessness, he will not recognize us on the day of judgment. 
as His. He tells us to build our house on the rock, which is faith in Jesus and His ultimate authority. And then He came down from the mountain. A lot of people heard him say these things. And we have it written in our scripture to tell us how to live and what's important. But the man that he met at the bottom of the mountain, the leper, the one that no one wanted, nobody cared about, nobody would go near, the man that had no hope for healing because of the debilitating disease eating away at his flesh, he touched him. He didn't talk to him except to say, I will be clean. He didn't touch physically the crowd that he spoke to on the mountain, but he touched the untouchable man. And I wonder how many people from that crowd actually lived out that life that he told them to live. I wonder how many of us are able and willing to take what he said in those, in those uh, three chapters into our lives and practice them. I know for sure, though, the man that he touched at the bottom of that mountain, the leper, will never be the same. There's no way he could possibly forget what Jesus did for him. He could not have been on that crowd up on the mountain because he was a leper. They wouldn't let him come near them. So I don't even think he could hear this whole proclamation that Jesus said. Couldn't hear his sermon. But he could experience Jesus in a miraculous, incredibly loving way to touch an unclean man. When was the last time someone touched him? It might have been his mother. Who knows? I mean, how long he had the disease. But we know as long as he's been a leper, no one touched him. And that is the power of God's love to come and touch us. He is intentional and he is focused and he is intimate with a despicable person. Whether it's a physical disease or someone like us that has been sinful and, and out of alignment with God. And that's what makes Jesus different from all other religious activity. It's being touched. He will touch us. The physical loving touch. I hope I and you can remember that all of those things in the Beatitudes. And basically, if we do them and focus on them, we kind of have the whole crux of our religion right there, short of what Jesus did at the bottom of the mountain. We have to remember the importance of intimacy and one-on-one -on -one contact, which we're blessed with today. One-on-five contact. <laughs> there, as we were praying on Wednesday night, I, we were, uh, Jennifer was praying in tongues, and I saw the image of Elijah the prophet Elijah, and he was standing alone on a mountain in this vision, and I saw him, he has a cloak, which he eventually gives to Elisha, he throws it on Elisha. And that's what I saw, and then he's all alone, and I saw like little, he wasn't crying, but there were tears in his eyes that he had had an emotional experience. But he was all alone on this mountain, and it was cloudy, and the wind was blowing, and... Uh, I knew what that image was because it comes out of uh, 1 Kings 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. And in this story, Elijah had been moving in power everywhere he went. And even fire from heaven would come down and consume the enemies of God. And uh, he had just, as Peter just told the story about teaching his children the other night, remarkably tying into what I wanted to say, that Elijah was fighting against a pagan society ruled by a pagan queen and a, and a lousy Israelite king, and they had gone after the Baals. They've gone after other 
things to worship and they have ignored their, the God of Israel. And he challenges them because they had set up a whole system like temples of Baal and, and hundreds of these priests that would come and there was sexual immorality in the religion and there was, uh, I forget the word for it, self-emulation where they would, uh, where they would uh, excuse me, that may not be the right thing, where they would hurt themselves and cut themselves. And, uh, and there was, they, they had desecrated all the things of God. So Elijah calls them up to Mount Carmel and he says, I'm going to challenge you. We're going to have two different sacrifices. I'll prepare mine to God. You prepare yours to uh, Baal and uh, we'll see which uh, fire will come and burn up the sacrifice. So they prepared the bulls and, um, and the, the pagan priest walked around, oh, wailing and talking and, you know, Ball, 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 ball. And they went on and on and on. And then they would cut themselves and whip themselves and um, calling down fire. Nothing came. And then in Elijah's case, he had green wood that was hard to burn. And they had gobs of water poured onto the sacrifice and the wood to make sure, you know, if this is going to start, it'll really be a miracle. And when Elijah's turn came, fire from heaven came according to the prayer of Elijah and burned up everything. Not just the, the, the meat, but the wood and the stones and everything else. And then people saw that and they said, well, this is God. So he challenged, he says, well, you know, on this day, if it's Baal who you want to serve, serve Baal. But if it's God, serve God all the way. And when they saw that, uh, he had the authority then to put those Baal priests to death and hundreds of them were executed. And Jezebel, who was taking over the power of her husband Ahab, uh, she, she was not an Israelite. She came from another nation, and but she was dominant in power over her husband. And she was the one who set up this whole system, and Ahab didn't stop her. So Elijah is now enemy number one to Jezebel. And she says, what you did to these sent him a message and said, what you did to the prophets of Baal, my prophets, I'm going to do to you today. I'm going to kill you. And Elijah takes off running into the desert. And he's exhausted and he's scared. And he's all alone. He has a servant, but he leaves the servant and he, and he just leaves the, the servant. You know, it's a complete abdication of his responsibility and everything that he was doing. God had told him, you have stuff to do and I want you to do it. But Elijah just freaked out and he just said, I'm out of here. I can't deal with this anymore. That Jezebel is going to kill me. And it says in verse three, then he was afraid. And he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. He was never afraid of the army when they came to arrest him. He would just call down fire. They consume him. But Jezebel sends this message and he runs off. And it says he, he went on a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And then he asked God if he could die, saying, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. He had a realization after being the most astounding prophet in Israel ever. You could say ever. He melts down. And I think he has a realization that he failed. How can I have let fear come into me? How could I have abandoned the task that you gave me, God? And I was doing so well and everything was going fine. But then he's alone with himself and his thoughts and then thinking, why did I do that? I just want to die. And he, he says, I'm no better than my father's. So the Israelites had failed God time and time again, and that's what he's talking about. I'm a failure, just like all these other. If you've never felt that, if you're a Christian and you think, I really screwed this up. I really messed up. I'm not good. I'm just like, or, you know, maybe in the past you were, and you used to look at other Christians and say, look how bad they are. And then all of a sudden you realize that's you. You're just as bad as all of the other ones that you talk bad about in some way. And he's just exhausted. And I think he's tired of himself. He says, just take me away. I'm worthless. How can I do this? 
even abandoning his servant. And then, and then uh, he laid down under this broom tree. And a broom tree, I had to look this up, they used to make brooms, oddly. <laughs> and they're found in desert areas, remote wilderness areas. And you'll just see out in the middle of nowhere, you'll just see one of these trees. And then a, to, the top, it's almost like a, a canopy, very thick. You know, picture those uh, Vietnamese brooms, that type of thing. You know? <laughs> if, for those who don't know what that looks like, it's, it's a bushy stem thing that comes out of a tree. And that's what this thing's made of. So it's kind of like a thatched roof. And he, he wants to be out of the sun. And he gets underneath this broom tree, which in certain times of year has beautiful bright yellow flowers and then also has a wonderful vanilla scent. So it's kind of, it's a nice place to be, especially in the wilderness. And uh, Elijah lays down there and he goes to sleep, exhausted by his situation. And while he's sleeping, said that an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. There's no, God doesn't speak a massive sermon to Elijah to get him motivated. He sends an angel, and there's a good chance that this is actually Jesus in a pre-form before he was born through Mary. And the angel comes and touches him. Just like Jesus touched the leper at the bottom of the hill, the desperate man with no friends and no community, no hope. And this is where Elijah is too. And this is the way God will come to us individually. It's so important to listen to the message that's given to the crowd. But it is life changing and sustaining to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus. To allow God to come and touch you. There are not enough words. Arise and eat. He's encouraging him. Just be a little stronger if you eat something. And get up. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. Nothing fancy. God doesn't need fancy. And we don't need fancy. We don't need a, a whole religious circus going on around us. You, you can be, it is far better to be in the wilderness under a broom tree, but alone with God and to have him touch you and to give you just a little bit, a little water, a little bread, and a little word, nothing complicated, arise and eat. And the angel of the Lord came again after Elijah had ate, eaten and drank. He laid down again and fell asleep. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. Why was he going to Horeb? What is Horeb? Horeb is Mount Sinai. H-O-R-E-B. It is the place where God met Moses in the burning bush. It is also the place where the Jews came after Moses went down into Egypt. God did the miracles and they set them free from slavery. And that is the place where God gave the Jews the Ten Commandments and appeared on the mountain. Why is he sending Elijah back there? There's no community there anymore. It's just Elijah on the Mount Horeb. It is a place to remind Elijah of the original covenant that God had with his people. He wanted him to go back and remember, this was where I promised to be your God. Get up and go. And he arose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. Two touches, one loaf of bread, one jar of water, and just a few words, and he was good. He was empowered to go back and remember the God 
who chose him and chose his people and to remind him of that covenant that God kept for hundreds of years. Hundreds and hundreds of years. He wanted him to remember that. And Elijah had discovered that even though he was the greatest prophet, he was still a weak man. And in spite of all the power and victories that God had given him, he's still vulnerable, still weak, still prone to, to want to give up and fail. And when he went the 40 days and 40 nights and he comes to the Mount of God, he goes into a cave there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said, see, this is how we know it's Jesus. It says in verse 9, 1 Kings 19, 9, And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him. See, the word said to him. That's Jesus is the word. So we know that the Lord is talking to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left a lonely victim. He's been good and loyal to God, and no one else has. That's what Elijah thinks. And if you've been serving God in any capacity, or in your family perhaps, and you've been good to God, and nobody else gives a duty about you or the Lord, and you're ready to just give up. You want to surrender. Say, I, I can't. This is impossible. It's only me. Only me. <clears throat> and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, go out. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And that's the vision I had on Wednesday. The point where he stands out on the mount before waiting for God. And I saw the little water in his eyes, not tears yet, but like, I'm just exhausted. I'm just tired of this whole thing. I'm tired of myself. I'm tired of my community. I'm tired, tired of all this religious stuff. And he's just standing there. And God said, go out and stand there. Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. The Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And again, he repeats the same story back to God. He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, blah, blah, blah. The same story. Verse 15, And the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of abel Mehola, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. God had just demonstrated his absolute incredible power. Wind, earthquakes, fire, <clears throat> rocks being torn apart, blasted to pieces. And then he whispers to Elijah, He's reminding him on that mountain where the covenant of God was made, the promises of God were made. I am in control of everything. I have all power. If I want to smash a mountain or a rock, I can do it. 
This is also the same place where Moses was told by God to strike the rock and let the water come out. He's reminding Elijah of who God is. And as small as Elijah is, as he realizes now, God is so much greater, so much bigger. But when he talks to the one person that is his, to the leper, to Elijah, to you and me, if we allow him to speak, if we focus and are intent on him, he will be focused and intentional and intent on us. He will whisper to you something that builds your faith. He will touch you. He will lift you up out of the burdens of your life. You have to be isolated and focused. That leper, I'm sure the crowd was coming down the mountain at the same time that Jesus was, but it was just the leper and Jesus. The leper didn't care who was there looking at him. He got on his knees and worshiped the Lord. And he expressed his faith that he could heal him, and the Lord touched him. The Lord touched Elijah. This is not complicated. This is power. This is love. This is intimacy. This is one-on-one, -on -one, man and God. That is the power that breaks the devil's stronghold. That's the power that overcomes these demons that are chasing us, the Jezebels. And it's the same power that provides resurrection and a new life. Just like that leper was healed and could be restored fully and completely. Could go get a job, get a wife and have a family and go back into a synagogue and no one could say he was, he was a leper anymore. It's resurrection power. And Elijah, the failed prophet, is now filled with the power of God. He's failed, but he's not. No longer arrogant and believing in his own power. He's been taken down to the point where God could whisper to him. And the whisper had power. Had more power for that individual than the rocks being smashed by the winds. And he said, Elijah, I am in charge here. And I have a plan for you to finish what, you, what I had started in you. And you're going to go and anoint two kings and one prophet. And they are going to bring vengeance on these people that are not following me. You don't have to do it. Elijah had taken full responsibility after the, the sacrifice was burned up and the Baal priests were killed. And he thought it was him. He thought it was his strength until God allowed Jezebel to scare him into humility out into the desert. And then he realized, I can't do anything. On my own. And then God took over. Okay, are you exhausted now? Let me touch you. I'm not giving you complicated instructions. I'm not going to overwhelm you with religion. I'm going to let you know, remind you that I promised you that I am powerful and that your job is not finished yet. And God doesn't call him a failure. He just strengthens him and sends him back out. And what God is going to do, he's going to do through these other people. But Elijah, he requires Elijah to finish what he has to do. Go and touch these two and that a prophet. And what do I do? If I know this, if I have this experience with God, I have to remember. I have to remember the covenant He made with me, the new covenant. I have to remember the times that He touched me and encouraged me when I was ready to give up. I have to remember that it isn't all on me, that He has a plan for my life, that He's the one who's in charge, and He has the power. And I don't need clever theology to use against myself or anybody else. All I need is the touch of the Lord, the touch of the Holy Spirit, and His Word to speak to me and encourage me. And when He has restored me, I can go a long way. As in the Good Samaritan. 
everything is one-on-one -on -one with God. I mean, that really, really counts, that lasts. The lawyer came in Luke 10, 25 to 37, and behold, a lawyer stood up to put Jesus to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? <clears throat> Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Just do that. But he, desiring to justify himself, and said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, and he tells him the story about the man that is struck by robbers and left on the ground, and how two religious men pass by, a priest and a Levite, and they don't do anything. They go on the other side of the street. But they have all the word of God inside them. But they never do anything to help the poor victim on the ground, except for the Samaritan, who the Jews thought were half-breeds and were outcasts themselves. But the Samaritan, who is not a priest, who does not have the full word of God, and doesn't, I'm sure he didn't even study the Torah, he sees the guy on the ground, and he stops and helps him. He touches him. Just like Jesus touched the leper, and, and the Lord touched Elijah in the desert, in the wilderness. This man who doesn't know, probably it wasn't there for the Sermon on the Mount, but inside him he has some kind of love for God and he loves other people and he sees the Samaritan on the ground and he doesn't read him the whole Bible or read out the Ten Commandments or even read the, the Sermon on the Mount. He picks him up in a very practical way, binds his wounds, puts him on his donkey, takes him to the inn, Gives the guy two days worth of salary, whatever that would be in those days or nowadays, add up your own salary. And that's what he leaves with the innkeeper. He says, I have to go, but would you please take care of him? Here's my money. I'll be back in a few days. He, and he said, if there's any additional cost, I will pay that. No religion here. He touched him. He focused on one person that really needed healing, that needed love, and he needed to uh, some sort of of sacrifice and warmth to come out of him. If you want to change people's lives, it's not only talking about religion and all of the conferences you've gone to and that you're in the prayer team or you're on the choir or whatever. Stop. Look for people. Exercise the power and love of God individually to individuals. It's not about building bigger buildings. This is a common theme in all my messages, right? But it is about people. One at a time. If God can spend all his energy on one leper, we can spend our time with just one person in our life if we have to. It's intentional. It's focused. It's intimate. And it's powerful. And it changes lives. James 2, we're almost done. James 2, 14 to 17. 14 to 17. What good is it, my brothers, <clears throat> if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. That's why I don't care about a big church. If there's no love. If there's no individual that I can reach out to or they can reach to me, what good is it? It's of no use. There, I'll just end with it. There's a good movie we watched last night about George Foreman. And growing up, I remember it was big, uh, heavyweight boxers. Did you guys see it? It's a good movie, but George Foreman's an amazing guy, and his story is just awesome. And um, not, but back in those days, I mean, everybody watched the the heavyweight championships: Muhammad Ali and George Foreman and Ken Norton, and Joe Frazier, smoking Joe Frazier from Philadelphia. He used to drive by his gym all the time in North Broad Street. Anyway, these guys are amazing boxers, and uh, 
But George Foreman, uh, he was a punk kid that, it, you know, God cut him a break and he actually ended up this amazing boxer. He had, became the world champion for, for a while. And then he lost it to Muhammad Ali. And the, well, you should watch the movie. But <laughs> um, and then he has a fight. And George Foreman, I didn't know this until I saw the movie. He died after the fight. Like he didn't feel right. And he like had some kind of heart failure. And he's like dead in the, according to the movie, I have to go research this. Uh, and then all of a sudden he hears voices and he sits up and he starts breathing. And he said, who's talking? And God's talking to George Foreman. And he gets saved that moment. And then he says, I'm done boxing. Well, this I knew this part of the story. I knew he became a Christian. I didn't know how. And then he he uh, he just says, I'm done. And all the money and all the fame just, just went away. And he became a pastor in this little tiny church in Houston. I think Houston. Well, that's where he was from. I know he was in Texas. And uh, and people are like, you're crazy, man. You know. So, so he, he goes there. And then in one of the services, according to the movie, uh, this grandma brings this kid up to him and says he's you know he's a punk basically he's getting in trouble with these gangs but he's kind of got boxing skills would you help him and the kid says i don't want this guy he lost to muhammad ali i want muhammad ali to teach me anyway that's in the movie. so george says hey god bless you son god will take care of you and he walks away and then he sees on the news that the kid gets arrested for robbery and it convicts him and he said I should have done something. I shouldn't have just said, God be with you and walk away. He was so in love with his own ministry that he didn't care about that person. And then, uh, but then he's convicted and he says, I'm going to start a youth center. I knew this part of the story uh, because I want the kids to have something to do and I want to spend my time to help them. So he's going to teach them how to box and that sort of thing. So anyway, he, he loses all his money because of a bad financial manager. And then, um, What's he going to do? So uh, the only he said, I only know two things, how to preach, and that doesn't pay anything, and how to box. Uh, he had sworn he wouldn't box again, but now he, he starts, you know, and he's 43 years old. He's fat. He's fatter than I am, you know. Um, and he starts, uh, you know, training, and then his wife wakes up in a vision and said, oh, I just saw that you're going to be champion, champion of the heavyweight champion of the world. And it's, you know, this is insane. Um, and then he goes back to box to make money and he just starts off. He beats one guy and another guy and then he starts losing weight. And all of a sudden he's got this this rack of, of knockouts and he gets an invitation to fight for uh, the uh, world championship again, the um, heavyweight championship. And he knocks out. Oh, no, he, he goes all the way to the last round with Evander Holyfield and almost wins. Uh, but he loses. But he still he makes 10 million dollars from this fight. And then um, his wife said, well, that's done, isn't it? He said, no, you had the vision that I was going to win the heavyweight championship. So he keeps fighting, and eventually he knocks out Morer, M-O-O-R-E-R, -E and becomes the heavyweight championship. Because God had told him and his wife that he would do it for his glory, to bring, and that God, George would talk about the Lord. And instead of the previous championship that he did on his own, this was God made it a miracle and he wanted everybody to know. And this is a true story. So uh, you should watch the movie. It's awesome. Um, so, but I'm thinking that intentionality that George realized in his own ministry, he should have been helping that kid instead of talking religion. And, and uh, we, depending on God for our victories, you know, you may be wiped out like George was, but if you... Now attach yourself with him. Not only can he raise you up to a good level in whatever you're doing, but you bring glory to his name now. That's the story and the advertisement for George Foreman's movie. <laughs> he also made $137 million selling those little grills. <laughs> but he was 45 years old when he won the, the, the heavyweight championship. That's, that's amazing. All right. Lord God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you that you can do miracles in our lives as we, even when we're stripped down to nothing out in the wilderness and or whatever our situation is, that if we just trust you, we learn to trust you, you'll build us up. 
the right way. And we will finish what you planned for us to start from the start. We pray, God, as you teach us that you, you can touch us and restore us physically, emotionally, spiritually, anywhere, one-on-one -on -one with you, that we learn to do the same with an individual. And that our situation is never completely over if we're a child of God. It may look bleak. It may look lonely. We may have failed terribly. But we are just one touch away from you, God. You are everywhere if we are yours. And all we need is that touch, the encouragement. We ask you to touch us today, Lord. Touch us and encourage us. Arise and eat. Arise and be healed. And go. Thank you, God. Thank you that you love each one of us. That each one of us is valuable to you. That you're watching us no matter where we are on this long journey. That we can trust you, even in our exhaustion, our frustration, feelings of defeat. You are there. Touch us, God. Restore us, God. And Lord, as we know you personally, as you re-strengthen us, we want to be like that Samaritan to go out and help someone else and to not to be the religious person walking on the other side of the road, but to look for individual people you put in our lives to make a difference. And things that we might do that seem small might be something that they remember for the rest of their lives. Maybe taking a kid to a baseball game or to a park or just giving an encouraging word or praying for someone or spending some part of our life into their lives to show someone loves them, someone cares, and that God is in it. Help us find the lonely, hurting people and help restore them by intentionally doing an act of kindness, a good deed to them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.